Thank you very much, Alistair, for your kind words. And thank you very much uh, for having invited me here to Manchester. I'm very happy to give this talk here because of my links to the UK. During this hour, I'd like to discuss with you an issue that has received a lot of press coverage lately, namely climate change induced migration. Uh, this is just a snapshot of some of the headlines you may have come across in the press. A lot of figures have been circulating as well uh, as to the numbers of potential climate migrants by 2050 or by 2100. We'll start by putting the question in perspective by looking at some statistics on migration and displacement. And then I'll give a brief overview of some of the results of current research on uh, human mobility and climate change. I will discuss mainly modeling of the links between climate change and human mobility, but we'll leave you with more questions than answers, possibly, uh, since I'll finish with a discussion of what I consider are the main challenges for which there is scope for more research on human mobility and climate change. So let's start by looking at some statistics. Uh, according to the UN's population division estimates, the number of international migrants in 2017 were 258 million people. And this is according to the UN definition of a migrant being someone living abroad for more than 12 months. To put this in proportion, uh, during the age of mass migration, over 40 million people migrated from Europe to the Americas. So this is from 1850 to 1913. The number of international migrants has increased in absolute terms, as you can see in the figure. Um, but the stock of international migrants as a proportion of the world population has not increased at the same rate. The ratio was relatively stable at around 2.3% of the world population from 1970 to 1980. And it has then increased to 3.4% in 2017. So the relevant question may be contrary to first intuition and be rather, why do so few people migrate internationally, given huge gaps in living standards across the globe? The composition of migration has changed, though, with a relative decrease in north-north flows and an increase in migration from the global south. So I'd like you to focus on the yellow line here that represents south-south migration. It's currently the largest share of migration, corresponding to almost 40% of international migrants. Also, south-north migration is increasing. It currently corresponds to around 35% of international migrants. So to just take one relevant example where severe impacts of climate change can be expected, most migrants from Africa migrate within the continent rather than going elsewhere. So current UN statistics show that 53% of African migrants remain on the African continent rather than in Europe, North America, or elsewhere. And in fact, most migration does not cross international borders. Turning to another form of migration, that is internal migration, as proxied by the urbanization rate, the average share of a country's population living in urban areas went from 39% in 1980 to 55% in 2017. Uh, and this average masks huge differences between high, middle and low income countries, with urbanization in high income countries reaching 80%, whereas low income countries have an average urbanization rate close to 30%. So, so these are some of the statistics on uh, the main forms of voluntary migration, internal and international migration. And apart from these general trends, it's also useful to recall the different categories of migrants according to the definitions used by the UN. So whereas international migrants are persons who change their usual place of residence and cross international borders, refugees are individuals who flee their country because of persecution, war or violence. <clears throat> 
according to the UN 1951 Convention. So the distinction lies in the motivation for migration and its voluntary versus involuntary nature. So here I'd like to recall some statistics related to displacement. Uh, whereas the stock of international migrants reached around 260 million in 2017, the number of refugees equals roughly 10% of international migrants. And this is the dark blue upper part of the bars that you see in the, in the diagram. In addition, uh, there were 3.1 million asylum seekers, according to the statistics of the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, UNHCR. So you see the 3 uh, million asylum seekers, that's the green part of the bar, and you have the 25 million refugees in the dark blue. But the largest part of displacement is represented by internally displaced people. So focusing on internally displaced people, this is a map from the Internal Displacement Monitoring Centre and it shows displacement related either to conflict, these are the orange circles, or related to weather disasters, these are the blue circles. And this is the map from 2017, to be compatible with the uh, other statistics I've shown. And uh, so you can see, for instance, the displacement related to Hurricane Irma in the Caribbean, the blue circles. Uh, according to the latest IDMC report, another 16 million people were displaced by weather-related disasters in 2018 alone. And two-thirds of global displacement is related to disasters, compared to conflict alone, ignoring for now any links between the two. The stock of internally displaced people numbered 40 million in 2017. So, Weather-related disasters and climate-related disasters in particular are responsible for a large part of internal displacement. And this even surpasses the numbers of uh, refugees as such, according to the UN uh, Convention. Further distinctions in human mobility can be added in the sense of the distinction between urgent displacement following natural disasters compared to planned population displacement. So here you see um, a spectrum of human mobility and this comes from the World Bank's report that I guess a lot of you know from last year called the Groundswell Report. So as we go from left to right we see a mobility decreasing. So this is showing both the international, internal migration and its voluntary versus involuntary nature, but above all it also shows the possibility that there are people who don't move, that rest immobile following climate change or disasters. But the figure also shows that dis uh, displacement can be urgent or sudden or planned. So if you look at within country mobility, internal migration, there can be displacement and planned relocation. And a recent example of this in a high income country is the planned relocation of 34 families living on the Isle of St. Charles in Louisiana following loss of the coastline due to sea level rise. But the fact remains that a sizable proportion of the population could remain immobile. And immobility can be a choice, but when it is involuntary it represents a problem of trapped populations, which should maybe be of more concern to policymakers than the actual migrants following climate change and extreme weather events. And uh, I'd like to add, when it comes to immobility, that there is a very interesting recent research by Ilan Noy on exit and voice uh, with examples from the small Pacific island nation of Tuvalu where the inhabitants choose not to migrate but rather to stay and voice their discontent with the lack of current climate policy.
Now the question is, are there climate refugees? One easy answer is no, not according to international law. The 1951 Geneva Convention and its subsequent 1967 protocol defines a refugee and the criteria to obtain asylum as a refugee, according to international law. And I put uh, an extract of the Convention on the Status of Refugees here. And I'll let you read the definition. There is no mention of climate. Uh, there are current NGO initiatives to create a status of climate refugees, such as the Nansen Initiative and the Platform on, on Disaster Displacement. But currently there is no such thing as a climate refugee, not according to international law. So given the difficulties of obtaining official recognition of the status of climate refugees, the International Organization of Migration gives a definition of climate migrants. And this is what we prefer to refer to when we discuss this issue, climate migrants rather than climate refugees. So I put up the definition here and you can see that it covers the entire spectrum of human mobility. Not only the distinction between individuals crossing international borders or not, but also according to the characteristics of migration, whether it's voluntary or forced, or the time scale, temporary or permanent. So this is more of the accepted definition of climate migrants currently. What do we know about migration as an adaptation strategy to climate change? Now I'll give a very brief overview of where we stand today on the issue, although it's too early to take stock because there's a lot of ongoing research on the topic. So what I cover here will be uh, illustrative rather than comprehensive. The answer depends uh, to a large extent on the specific manifestation of climate change. Uh, so just to recall, climate is the long-term average of weather and climate change entails a change in the distribution of long-term weather. But most empirical work linking climatic factors to migration has relied on year-to-year -year weather measures and climate variability. So climate change, as you know, will not only entail increasing average surface temperature, but also changes in precipitation patterns, increased frequency in extreme weather events, and sea level rise and coastal flooding, to mention only a few of its manifestations. The literature on climate-induced migration typically distinguish between slow onset events, such as increases in temperature, drought, other land and forest degradation, sea level rise and salinization. And this doesn't mean that there aren't threshold effects. So for instance, sea level rise, we may very well be locked into a certain scenario, but it will play out over the long run. So these are slow onset events. And on the other hand, the literature distinguishes between slow onset events and fast onset events that are sudden and are rather difficult to predict, at least up to a few days such as tropical cyclones, so hurricanes or typhoons, depending on where you are, and floods. So for fast onset events, there's a large literature on floods that show that typically they induce only temporary short-term displacement migration. Uh, there is an issue here also with uh, what kind of measures are used, as was shown uh, originally by Gutierrez, Gina and Mobarak, and uh, Chen et al, for instance, show that using uh, satellite-based uh, measures of floods uh, actually show that there is a negative probability of moving, that uh, floods rather would decrease mobility rather than increase mobility. So we either see no response, no migratory response, or only a temporary response. Uh, hurricanes, on the other hand, induce migration that can be permanent, and we've seen this in, in several studies, uh, also from high-income countries. But as a general trend, we tend to see that permanent migration is induced to a larger extent by uh, 
slow onset events. Uh, it's induced rather by higher temperatures, as has been seen in studies from Indonesia, the Bora Mishra, Open Amiran Siang study, and from Pakistan in Miller, Gray, and Kosick's work. And in particular, the World Bank's Groundswell report from last year uh, that focused on projections of internal migration estimated that between 35 and 145 million people could have to move internally by 2050 because of drought and sea level rise alone. And what's interesting to note is that part of the difference in the migratory response that we observe could be due to policy. So for instance, Miller et al. suggests that some of the results on uh, less migration following a uh, flood could be due to uh, the existence of flood relief. Whereas there are no policy measures at the similar scale for drought. And also in the Boost and et al. work using census data in the US over so the 30s and 40s and onwards, uh, they showed that there was actually in-migration into counties at flood risk because of the measures that were developed at the time such as levies and, and flood warnings, whereas there was out-migration from uh, districts at risk of hurricane. And another uh, very common uh, conclusion of the studies on internal migration and climate change is that higher temperatures and increased frequency natural disasters increase urbanization rates. And this is a finding already from the earlier work by Barrios et al. And as Henderson has shown, though, this also depends on the existence of, of alternative uh, work possibilities. So the, the capital infrastructure around cities. But turning now to international migration, uh, the evidence here has been much more ambiguous in some sense. The picture isn't that clear. Uh, the first analysis using data on yearly migration flows and hence captured uh, short-term migration trends, they showed increases in international migration rates following uh, temperature increases and precipitation shortages. And here I list a few examples of those studies. Recent studies have focused more on conditional results uh, focusing on an agriculture mechanism uh, showing that higher temperatures increase short-run bilateral migration rates from agricultural countries in particular and, and that there is no response in general. And in fact studies using the World Bank migration stock data that is decadal data that permit you to deduce long-term migration trends over decades show or find no general effect of temperature and precipitation anomalies on long-term migration. So this is Bain and Parsons' study. But they do show important indirect effects on wages. So there is strong evidence of a wage channel. And using this same long-run migration uh, trend data, but conditioning on countries' level of economic development, Catania and Peary found that increasing temperatures will decrease immigration rates from the poorest countries in the world. And the, such results were also found by Bain and Parsons in a later study and Groeschel and Steinbach, who found that extreme weather events would increase mobility only in middle income countries. And an explanation for this could be that individuals in poor countries are constrained to move. They can't afford to migrate, whereas individuals in rich countries are have insurance, uh, availabilities of insurance. And one issue though is still that most of these studies rely on temporal weather variation for identification and may not accurately measure migratory responses to actual climate change in terms of a change, a change distribution. And uh, this is something I come back to later in my, in my talk. An even more interesting question for policy may be uh, the, the following. Where do the climate-induced migrants go? Uh, and we know that there is out-migration from hurricane-struck areas, but what the studies have found, and in particular the studies following Hurricane Katrina, is that, first of all, 
the, the event decreased the distance that the migrants would travel, but they would also move partially into uh, counties and regions that were still at risk of hurricane. So this is extremely relevant for policy to know where, where do the migrants go uh, and who are they? And uh, also on the international studies, such as Kathleen Ampere and Baina Parsons, uh, they show that the distances traveled decrease with the extent of the extreme event. That, that's showing this impact on wealth and hence the possibility to migrate away from areas at risk. So this is extremely uh, policy relevant conclusions of the current research. And this is also a big issue then for city planners and urban uh, policy, the, the issue of the extent of the implications that this will have on cities in terms of uh, increased population and increased environmental pressure on cities following climate induced migration. But this is a big issue that I, I will not be able to go into further here because of um, time constraint. Following this brief and incomplete survey of current research, we'll go on a journey through different models and approaches to analyze climate induced migration. And as you see and know from this uh, quotation, it's hard to find one good model. So it'd be a journey through different models, but more of a journey through time than through space. In 1885, the German physicist Ernst Georg Ravenstein published his article entitled The Laws of Migration. Following Newton's law of gravity, Ravenstein posited that migration flows from country I to country J would be proportional to the population in the origin country, PI here, and um, proportional to the population in the destination country, PJ, but inversely proportional to the distance between the two countries. And as an aside, let me underline that uh, G here does not equal the universal gravitational constant. It can denote time invariant factors specific to the origin country. Or... The popularity of this model probably stems from the ease of estimation after putting the migration flows in log form. And it has since become a workhorse model in the analysis of migration and it has been extended to incorporate the amenity of living in a certain location, such as its climate and environmental factors. But what I'd like to discuss here are some of the methodological challenges linked to analyzing bilateral migration data using the gravity model. Uh, and they are described elsewhere by experts in migration economics. And I'd like to focus here on some problems related to applying the gravity model for analysis of climate change and migration. And the first issue is uh, bad controls. Uh, even if uh, climatic factors are not added in an ad hoc manner, but derived from a random utility model a la Anderson, uh, the estimation of migration flows as dependent on both income and climatic factors create a bad control problem, or what's known as over-controlling in, in the macro literature, since uh, income depends in itself on climate. Uh, and this is then avoided by excluding these factors. But uh, a larger issue is uh, the problem of correlated shocks. So the derivation of the gravity equation in a random utility framework assumes that shocks are independently and identically distributed in every location. And knowing that climate change is a systemic large scale phenomena, the use of this kind of model has limitations unless possible correlation in where the shocks are accounted for. And this can be done traditionally by spatially adjusted standard errors. But one of the open research questions is really how human mobility responds to correlated shocks at the scale uh, that climate change is likely to create. And this applies not only to future climate, but uh, can already be detected currently in phenomena such as El Nino and Southern Os Oscillation, the ENSO. And current research has analyzed how agricultural markets respond to this kind of a correlated shock. But very little has been done so far on its implication for migration. And since the well-known article by Ross and Stark, we know that migration may occur to diversify income risk. Uh, 
But this user migration relies on destinations with shocks that are uncorrelated and that are attainable at non-prohibitive costs. So this is really uh, an area where there is a scope for much more uh, future work linking climate change and migration. So large scale correlated climatic phenomena. And uh, as a final point, the gravity model does not account for general equilibrium effects on factor prices. So it's not well adapted for projections of future migrant flows to the extent that large migration flows could affect wages and unemployment rates. But who are the climate induced migrants? Are they different from typical migration flows from the past? And to study that question, we really need other models that allow us to study selective migration. And to start then, we need to recall a phenomena called the migration transition that dates back from at least Zelinsky's work in migration economics. It's also called the mobility transition. It, it stems from cross-country studies where it is found that the immigration rate increases up to a certain threshold of GDP per capita and then decreases as the country's per capita income increases. And the most common explanation for the empirical finding of a hump-shaped pattern in the relation between uh, wealth and migration has been liquidity constraints. And indeed, migration is costly. And in very poor countries, the poorest segments of the population cannot afford to migrate. Most current migration is in fact regional, and several studies show that climate-induced migration will, to a large extent, imply regional displacements rather than international displacements. And in microeconomic research, several recent analyses of migration quantifies the difference in costs between households. For Indonesia, Clearmans finds that the average costs of migrating to an urban area is four times as much as the cost of migrating to a nearby village. And these costs are lower the lower the wealth. And Batsy in his 2017 article estimates that the fixed costs of international migration represent twice the annual expenditures of poor Indonesian households. And that those costs in rural areas can reach four or five times the level of yearly expenditures. And since the gravity model is a macro approach, alternative approaches are called for to better study heterogeneity among migrants. So one alternative, rather than fitting gravity models on aggregate data, is to analyze migration choices in the microeconomic framework of the roy borges model. So this is the Roy 1951 model as adapted by Borges. And in particular, the credit constraint implied in this figure can be captured in a simple and clear manner in the Roy Borges model. And in that way, the Roy Borges model can be used to answer policy relevant questions such as who are the climate migrants? And in particular, how do they differ uh, from migrants in general? Oh dear, <laughs> this is my timekeeper. No, actually, he's here to remind me that the original a uh, paper by Roy, if you read the classical paper, discuss the case of an imaginary village in which inhabitants could engage in two activities, fishing or hunting. And uh, Roy asks himself the question whether the right people will go rabbit hunting and whether those who fish will be those who are the most skilled to do so. So any rabbit hunting, not just white rabbits. And uh, I'll quote from the original paper, because um, as an aside, later on, the descendants of the original villagers have migrated into townships where they diversified their activities to include also the writing of scientific theses. To please the resource economists among us, I quote, fishing still remains the most respected professional, though it is closely rivaled by the writing of scientific papers of uniform quality, exactly 6,000 words long. Uh, this much to say that we have uh, much to live up to in terms of elegance and humor in the writing of scientific papers. But let's turn to the Roy Borges model. In its simplest form, the Roy Borges model assumes that the wage that can be earned in the origin country, denoted here with the subscript zero, 
is W0 and that it has a deterministic component, mu0, that we will later then say is dependent on temperatures, T. And it's also made up by an arrow term, epsilon0, that's normally distributed with expectation 0 and variance sigma squared. So this is a, a model where we assume that everyone will be working in a sector that is dependent on climatic factors. And here to simplify, uh, I'll use just temperature, but this can obviously be interpreted as bad weather in general and represents several dimensions of bad weather. But for notation and simplicity, it's just temperature here, T. And we will assume, following several studies on the effects of temperature and productivity, that higher temperatures decrease the expected wage rate in the origin country. The destination country wage also is assumed to have a deterministic component, mu1, and uh, an arrow term, epsilon1, that represents unobserved factors, typically also normally distributed with mean zero and an arrow term, and a different variance, sigma2 but it's not dependent on temperature here, which is a simplification, but this is a, a simple way of capturing the difference uh, in the impact of high temperatures. And um, then we can write down the incentive constraint for migration. So we're going to assume that there is a fixed uh, cost of migrate, uh, a migration that's equal to C. So an individual would migrate if the gains from migration in terms of increased wages exceed expected wages, exceed the migration cost, C. So here we see that higher temperatures would increase the income differential, the expected wage, and hence increase migration, as is typically expected. But in poorer countries, it's another constraint that will be more relevant. And this will be the second constraint, the liquidity constraint. So in this model, migration costs have to be paid upfront before migration takes place. So it's the origin which that has to determine the, uh, whether migration is possible or not. So here we can see that rising temperatures instead increases the threshold of migration and typically implying a decrease in migration rates. And this is the kind of model that's been used, notably in Catania and Piri, to capture the poverty climate migration trap found in several recent analyses. And um, we can write down then the migration rate in poor countries using the normal distribution and uh, capture this uh, climate poverty trap very clearly. So the Roy Borges model shows us that following an increase in temperature, migration increases in middle income countries, but would decrease in poor countries. And uh, another issue is that migration costs also could be impacted by weather. So we could use the model to take this into account as well. So if migration costs are weather sensitive and actually are higher after a weather shock or a climate change, migration would decrease even further or as equal. Then I'd like to um, discuss uh, another aspect that is important, namely distribution of effects. Uh, what matters for the predictions of the Roy Borges model is the correlation coefficient between the skills distribution in the origin country and the destination country. If the skills payoffs are highly correlated between origin and destination countries, Migrants will be positively selected if the income distribution is more unequal in the destination than in the origin country. But migrants will be negatively selected if the income distribution is more equal in the destination country compared to the origin country. So, if and if the correlation between payoff to skills in the origin and the destination countries is low, migrants could be negatively selected according to the income distribution of the origin country, but positively selected based on the income distribution in the destination. And this is, you know, this is what Borges called refugee selection. That is, they do relatively well in the destination country. So we could imagine using the Roy Borges model to analyze the effects of climate change on the income distribution. 
So if climate change then typically worsens the income distribution in poor countries, as has been found in several studies, one of the predictions that could be drawn based on the Roy Borges model is that if the migration costs are constant, or, or at least not correlated with ability, or skill mm. variant but low, and if climate change worsens the income distribution in low-income countries more than in high-income countries, the selection of migrants may change and become less selected on skills than during previous migration episodes. So how do these models uh, stand up to reality? Uh, I will discuss uh, two shortcomings uh, for which uh, the ongoing work aims at uh, making the models more complete and more relevant for, for policymaking. The first one concerns uh, climate change's impacts on human capital and migration. So to study this, we need to introduce schooling. And schooling here that I measure with the variable S has this component that is determined by temperature. So it's basically the formal schooling measured in number of years. And we will assume that you have returns to schooling that are different in the origin country versus the uh, destination country, given by R. Um, this I will introduce later on. But if we only focus on schooling, the impact of climate change on human capital is not unambiguous ex ante. On the one hand, several studies show decreasing productivity when experiencing higher temperatures. And taking the effect on schooling only, climate change in the form of rainfall shortfalls could lead to a lower level of schooling based on an income effect. From a microeconomic perspective, there could also be substitution effects in the form of a lower opportunity cost to, of putting a child in school, um, which would increase attendance and the level of schooling with a worsening climate. So the net effect of higher temperatures on schooling has been found both positive and negative in empirical studies, for instance, uh, by Shaw and Steinberg. So here um, we will assume that the expected schooling in the origin country is given by mu s, and it has a uh, variance epsilon s with uh, mean uh, zero. And we will, uh, for now, we just assume that higher temperatures will decrease schooling so that the income effect dominates. And if we include this in the Roy Borges model, we can then rewrite the liquidity constraint and see the impact in this more uh, fuller model. So the liquidity constraint for migration then will see that the high temperature will have the direct effect on the expected wage, but it will also have this additional effect of reducing migration because of the effect on human capital measured as, as formal schooling. So it will make the liquidity constraint bind even more and make migration even more difficult in poor countries. But this is a, a partial equilibrium model. And as such, it excludes uh, responses in fertility rates and investment in education. And analyses using overlapping generations model show the effects on human capital investment in the origin countries. In fact, the possibility to migrate typically increases incentives to invest in human capital. And with migration, a brain drain may occur. And recent works, notably by Chayeg, Casey et al, show the possibility that following selective migration, the returns to investment in human capital in the country of origin can increase and hence have a beneficial effect on the level of investment in education in the origin country. And this positive effect would partially offset the negative direct effect of climate change in the origin country. So this is very much a field uh, of ongoing research uh, which is very important, I think, to link the research on climate change's impact on human capital with uh, its impact on migration. The second issue I'd like to discuss with you 
are um, the channels, the mechanisms linking climate change and migration. So most analyses do not integrate migration as an adaptation strategy with the availability of other adaptation strategies in the origin country. And most analyses so far are reduced form. And here you see a list, a partial list of some of the main channels that link climate change and migration. So typically analyses have focused on agricultural impacts, but we also know that there are effects of climate change on labor productivity and total factor productivity. The references you see, by the way, they are the ones, um, the main ones documenting the, the direct impact of climate change on these, uh, in these areas. Uh, since little work has been done to link it to migration, I'm citing for the conflict channel, for instance, I'm citing recent work by Bossetti, Catania, and Piri, and Abel et al, that try to uh, look at the mechanisms by which the climate affects conflict and then conflict affects migration, uh, adopting, for instance, two-stage approaches uh, to analyze this further. And there's the work by Burgess et al linking health and migration, but Otherwise, these are the references for the direct effects of climate change. And what I want to uh, emphasize here is that we need more work uh, linking these direct effects of climate change to migration. And in particular, I want to focus here on one particular channel, namely the agricultural channel. Uh, since here we know that farmers adapt, they do change, uh, they change uh, planting dates, harvesting dates, following uh, the uh, observations on, on weather and climate change. And they can adapt on farm by changing the technologies they use, notably when we talk about drought or increased temperatures, they can invest in irrigation. Uh, they can adopt drought resistant crops and change crop varieties. Um, Farmers or individuals in the agricultural sector can also adapt via the off-farm labor market. Uh, they can use asset accumulation, formal or informal credits, or participation in risk-reducing networks to cope with, uh, with uh, climate change. But here I'd like to uh, show you how adaptation or the possibility of other means of adaptation, such as these, can be integrated into Roy Borders' model of migration. So let's assume for now that adaptation is exogenous. Obviously, adaptation will depend on uh, beliefs about climate change. But for simplicity, let's consider adaptation fixed, representing infrastructure or uh, exogenous public policy. So we can write down the country wage rate um, as before, but now it will depend not only on temperature, but also on access to alternative adaptation. Uh, you could think of irrigation infrastructure, for instance. So we will make a very simple assumption, namely that if such adaptation exists, the negative impact of higher temperatures will be larger. Remember, it's negative. Will be larger in the countries where there isn't any access to other alternative adaptation compared to country where there is access to alternative adaptation possibilities. And then we can rewrite the incentives to migrate. So access to other adaptation options would reduce the incentives to migrate because the impact of high temperatures will be smaller on the expected wage in the origin country. But studying the liquidity constraint, you can see that access to other adaptation options would actually enable poorer countries to maybe have a high migration rate. The uh, possibility of paying for migration would be higher given access to other adaptation options. But I draw no conclusion here on the aggregate welfare effects, which are the most important, of course. Uh, typically, at least for the migrants, welfare improves with migration. But this can depend on the type of migration, whether it's permanent or temporary or with the family or not. Uh, but this illustrates how we could extend current modeling of migration. So now, to the outstanding challenges. Uh, there are other issues we need to address, although they may seem daunting. The first challenge I'd like to discuss with you is how to model forced displacement. If you recall the categorization of different forms of mobility, 
28 million people were forcibly displaced in the year 2018 alone, according to the IDMC's global report. Out of these, 16 million were displaced because of weather-related natural disasters and almost 11 million because of conflict. This shows the importance of the consequences of climate change already now, since most new displacements are linked to weather-related disasters and not conflicts. And this is even without taking into account that part of the conflicts can be induced by increases in temperature and water scarcity. This uh, third category of migration, forced displacement, poses a challenge on its own to economic analysis. If such displacement does not result from a voluntary choice, how can it be modelled using economic analysis? Some conclusions can already be drawn on the basis of the Roy Borges model by considering an augmented version of the original model that accounts for the joint influence of economic factors and amenity factors, which could include not only climatic factors, but also institutional factors such as the level of civic liberties. Compared to economic migrants, forced migrants will be driven more by such amenity factors in the place of origin rather than by economic factors. And this implies that skill selection will not be as prominent among such involuntary migrants. We could hypothesize that persons displaced by climate change would be less selected on economic criteria. The other hypothesis that can be drawn from the model is that the choice or destination will be different. Whereas economic migrants weight the economic gains against the cost of migration, situations of forced displacement can make the decision to leave both unforeseen and sudden. And the importance is to escape the threat. So forced migration may not involve the same destination countries as observed in the past. In fact, one could predict that forced migrants and refugees would go shorter distances to neighboring countries. Such destinations would typically not be chosen by economic migrants to search for the highest increase in well-being. The second challenge I'd like to discuss with you is how to better integrate beliefs into uh, the analysis of migration. Uh, as is well known, migration can be undertaken either as an ex-ante adaptive strategy, responding to the perceived riskiness of the environment in the usual place of risk their residence, or as an exposed coping mechanism to shock. And this has been accounted for in some early work on uh, extreme weather events and migration. In such a context, an ex-ante decision is taken before the realization of a weather shock. And the decision is based on the riskiness of the environment that the house lives in, typically measured by the coefficient of variation of income or by the variation in the weather factor directly. Following the realization of weather, households may choose migration as a shock coping strategy if formal insurance is not available. What's still not modeled in most analyses of climate change and migration are beliefs and their role in the migration decision. Why would someone move following drought if it is believed to be a temporary variation in the current climate? Since migration is costly, other on-site adaptation strategies may be more efficient. For migration to be a response to climate change, the individual should interpret the extreme weather event as a permanent change in climate in order to adapt. And similar to recent work on the rule of beliefs in adaptation to climate change in the agricultural sector, a better modelling of the role of information should provide for better projections of future migration. The issue of beliefs on variability in the current climate versus climate change is important in order to interpret migration as an adaptation strategy to climate change. And information policies could potentially lead to better migration destination choices for the migrants themselves. As shown in uh, Rosenzweig and Udris uh, recent work, uh, all the informative force costs can allow farmers to make ex-ante migration choices that improve their welfare. Errors in forecasting increase exposed variability in agricultural wages. So this indicates that public policy, and especially social safety nets, may be important to complement individual adaptation. The third challenge I'd like to discuss with you is how to improve the projections of future migration caused by climate change. And there are several uh, ways we can do this. Uh, learning from the past, migration surveys, um, using uh, general equilibrium modeling or agents-based modeling. I'd like to start with uh, learning from the past. Uh, 
some of you may recognize this picture. It's from the Dust Bowl uh, in the 1930s in uh, the Midwest of the US. Um, I show this picture because one of the weaknesses with assisting analysis is really the extent to which we can extrapolate to make future predictions based on econometric estimations relying on past data without the climate extremes that can be expected in the future. So one uh, option is then to look at similar extreme events that have occurred in the past. And there is really fascinating work here based on economic history by Hornbeck, Colong and Sue, looking at uh, changes in mobility patterns and on farm adaptation during the Dust Bowl experience in the US in the 1930s. And in particular, Long and Sue found marked differences both in the destination choices and also differences in the characteristics of the migrants that left the counties affected by the Dust Bowl compared to the migrants who left the same counties before the Dust Bowl. So this is one option then that we could make better projections for future migration flows. This will be uh, learning from past extreme events. Then uh, because of uh, time constraints, I will have to uh, skip the, the parts. I will have to um, leave out the parts on using surveys and migration intentions and um, general equilibrium models and come to the conclusions so that I respect the time for the egg timer sessions that follow. So I've been trying to give you um, an overview of some of the patterns and conclusions that can be drawn based on existing studies, notably with respect to the difference in migratory responses following different types of extreme weather events. And I'm finishing on this note that there are still many aspects of the linkages between climate change and human mobility that have not yet been addressed and you see them here. But I'll finish here. Thank you, everyone.